Okay, last week we looked at the period relating to the time of the exile, say 587 down to 539 B.C., the return from exile, 539 down to 430 B.C., and the time of Herod the Great. So that's 72 B.C. to 4 B.C., though some people, as I said, might put Herod's death at 2 or 1. Now for the period of the Lord's life, we looked at what, uh, what may well be his childhood home here in Nazareth. And here is a map. And if I have the little pointer, you can see Nazareth is up here. You see down here, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. This is Galilee. Uh, where is Jerusalem here? There's Jerusalem. So that's where we were looking there. And we looked at the synagogue in Capernaum. And we also looked at what is very likely Peter's house which is also in Capernaum. And then here's an aerial view because it wasn't clear that the structure there was octagonal as I had described it, but it is octagonal. You can see this. So that's the octagonal church that was built over it. And that is in Capernaum. And Capernaum is up here on the Sea of Galilee. So we looked at, we looked at those things. Now when we ended, I just noted that John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 it says that Jesus was on his way to Galilee. When he was on his way to Galilee, he came to Jacob's well at Sychar in Samaria. This is here. He came there, Sychar in Samaria. It says, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. In Genesis chapter 33, verse 18 and 19, Joshua 24, 32, they locate that field at Shechem. Now, John chapter 4, verse 20 indicates that they were at the foot of Mount Gerizim. So when this is happening, this well, they're at the foot of Mount Gerizim. And there's no reference in Scripture to a well being dug by or for Jacob. But it was no doubt called Jacob's well because of its proximity to Jacob's field in Shechem. That would be why it would be called. He didn't dig it. It wasn't dug for him as far as we know. But it's called Jacob's well probably because of that proximity. And this is, of course, where Jesus conversed with the Samaritan woman. Now, a well, a well that is located at the base of Mount Gerizim, less than a half mile southeast of ancient Shechem, which is Tel Balata, it's uh, just east of modern Nablus, and about a half mile south of the village of Askar, thought to be ancient Sychar, there is a well there that is accepted by Jews, Samaritans, Christians, and Muslims as Jacob's well. Now, it's now located in a Greek Orthodox church, and this well was mentioned in A.D. 333 by a traveler known as the, the Pilgrim of Bordeaux, and it was mentioned also in the 4th century by Eusebius. Jerome, in 3, A.D. 380, he indicated that a church had been built on that site. That church was destroyed in the 7th century. It was replaced by another church in the 12th century, and the Greek Orthodox Church bought the well and the property around it in 1885. So this is almost certainly, this is Jacob's well, mentioned there in John chapter 4. Now in John chapter 5, verse 2, it mentions a pool in Jerusalem located near the Sheep Gate, and the pool in Aramaic is called Bethesda. And John notes that that pool has five roofed, colonnades, covered walkways. He says there are five of them. Now the Sheep Gate, it's known to be located on the north side of the Temple Mount and the Copper Scroll from Qumran, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the scrolls is known as the Copper Scroll. It dates before AD 70, so before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And that scroll refers to Beth Eshdathayan. So you see Bethesda, Beth Eshdathayan, and so it refers to Beth Eshdathayan, which means house of the twin pools. House of the twin pools. Now Eusebius also, he identifies the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem as having twin pools, as does the pilgrim of Bordeaux, and Eusebius alludes to it being in proximity of the temple area. So we have the pool of Bethesda, twin pools in the temple area, near the sheep gate, and the fact that it has twin, twin pools that fits with the five roofed colonnades. 
because you have one on each side of the perimeter of the two pools and one walkway between them. So that would fit with the five colonnades. Now shortly after the turn of the 20th century, two large pools were found up here. North, here is the, the Temple Mount. There is Sheep Gate. And two large pools were found there at the uh, shortly after the turn of the 20th century. They were cut into rock and they were plastered. And many fragments of columns and bases and drums have been found, which in the words of archaeologist John McRae, he says, quote, probably belong to the five porches, that is, porticos or colonnaded walkways of the pool John mentions. So here we have the pool of Bethesda almost certainly there. Now in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, Jesus heals a blind man by having him go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the healed man, he mentions that pool by name in John chapter 9, verse 11, when he's recounting the healing uh, uh, to other people. So this pool of Siloam. Now the site that was commonly thought to be the pool of Siloam was discovered in, in the 19th century by a man named Bliss Vedicky. And in its present form, that pool dates to the 5th century when a church was constructed at that site. So you've had changes to it. It goes, it's ancient, but its present form, when the church was constructed, has, it's, it's in an altered form, and the original size and shape of that pool is not known. But in 2004, a very large pool was discovered by archaeologist Eli Shukrin near the south side of this traditional pool. So how these two connected or related is not clear, but they found a very large pool there. It's about 165 feet long. And it's lined with stone, and it has steps leading down into the pool from all sides. And there's this elaborately paved uh, assembly area adjacent to the pool. And the pool was apparently constructed in two phases. It was constructed in the first century BC, so it would have been there when Jesus was there, and then it was modified or changes were made to it, it seems like, in the late 60s. Now, many people are confident that this is the actual pool of John chapter 9 and that John's information is, is corroborated here. You have this pool. Now, here's an artist's rendering of what that pool would have looked like. And so it's quite a, it's quite a deal. And again, I say the connection of it to the... The traditional pool of Siloam is not really clear. Archaeologist David Graves says, while scholars debate the function of the pool, what is not debated is that the pool was used in Jesus' day with this confirming the topographical accuracy of the Gospel of John. So here we have John referring to this. We have it mentioned in Scripture. It's here, and we wind up, uh, we discover it. And I, I think that's, uh, that's neat. I when I preach, I leave myself notes so I don't say this at the beginning. I'm preaching tonight. If you have nothing else to do, love to have you. Because <laughs> if, I, if I say it at the beginning, you know how you are. All right. Now, all four Gospels, they record that Pontius Pilate, he was the Roman governor who handed Jesus over to be crucified. And his role in that event, it's noted in several places in Acts, and Paul refers to it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. Now, in 1961, Antonio Frova discovered in Caesarea, up here, he discovered in Caesarea an inscription in Latin mentioning Pontius Pilate. The left side of the inscription, as you can see, has been chipped away. And it's thought that it was chipped away so the stone could be better fit into a secondary usage. So rather than go and get new stones, if I got one here, I'm just going to bust this baby and make him fit. And so that's what they think is happening. But you can still uh, reconstruct the second and third lines quite clearly. And they say Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. Now the entire inscription, it's thought to have read to the people of Caesarea... Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has given the Tiberium 
And the Tiberium, people speculate, that was a temple, temple dedicated to the emperor Tiberius. But in any event, I don't know if you can see it here, but you see Pontius Pilatus. There he is right there. So that's, you know, so you have these, these characters in the, you know, in scripture, and then here you see them uh, appearing live and in color in the things that we discover and we uncover. Now, Annas, Annas is mentioned, this thing rolls off, Annas is mentioned in Luke chapter 3, verse 2, John chapter 18, verse 13, 18, 24, Acts chapter 4, verse 6, and he served as high priest from A.D. 6 to A.D. 15, and Annas is called high priest after the time of his officially serving in that capacity, presumably in a way similar to our continuing to refer to presidents as presidents. So after they're out of the office, you still have President Bush, and you say, well, he's not president anymore. I know that. But you see how that goes. So that's presumably why Annas was still, but he actually served in the office from A.D. 6 to 15, and he no doubt continued to wield a great deal of power and influence, as indicated by the fact his son-in-law, Caiaphas served as high priest from A.D. 18 to 36 or 37, as did five of his sons. So he's mentioned there. Now, in 1994, archaeologists Lean and Kathleen Rittmeyer, they made a very strong case that the first century burial tombs just south of the Temple Mount, here you see the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, here where the Hidron Valley Hinnom Valley and the Kidron Valley, right here where they connect, he made a very, they, they made a very strong case that, that here is, the, that these tombs in this area popularly known as the Keldama, that they include the tomb of Annas, the high priest. And this is what is thought to be his tomb. Now, rather than being a poor person's burial ground, this is an area of elegant, and elegantly decorated tombs. It may not look that way to you now, but that's what this area was. Now, there are no identifying inscriptions that says, you know, here's Annas, but there are three lines of evidence that link the tomb to Annas. As the Rittmeyers say, the tombs of Akeldama are too elaborate to have been anything but burial places for Jerusalem's prominent citizens. Their decoration echoes that of the Temple Mount, where the priests served, and Josephus, he's a first century Jewish historian, Josephus places the tomb of Annas in the area of Akeldama. So those three things convince the Rittmeyers and many others that this is in fact the tomb of Annas, and here is their reconstruction of what it would have looked like. You saw this, all you got to see was just this broken piece here. You see it comes up like this, but they think it would have looked like that in the day. It would have been something, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite large, uh, quite worthy of somebody who, you know, thought he had some altitude. Caiaphas. Caiaphas, as I mentioned, he served as the high priest from A.D. 18 to 36 or 37. He was involved in the plot, of course, to arrest and kill Jesus. And Jesus was brought before Caiaphas to stand trial. Now, in 1990, a very ornate ossuary. Now, an ossuary is a burial bone box. There was a very brief time, maybe a century, and particularly in and around Jerusalem, where the burial practice became that you would go and entomb somebody, and after a year or so, when the flesh had gone off, off the, you know, had decayed, you would then go and collect the bones, and you would put the bones in a box, and the box is called an ossuary. And so in 1990, an ornate ossuary was discovered in Peace Forest, which is south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It was discovered by workers who were building a water park. Now, what kind of a place to live? You're out there doing construction, and you find a first century ossuary. You know? But that's what happened. It dates to the first century, and it has two inscriptions, one in Aramaic and one in Hebrew, which may be translated, and many think this is the right translation, Caiaphas for one, and the other Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Now, what's interesting is Josephus, 
the Jewish historian, he gives Caiaphas' full name as Joseph, who is called Caiaphas, of the high priesthood. Now, inside this ossuary, there were bones of six people, including a 60-year-old man, which was about Caiaphas' age when he died. Now, many scholars are convinced that this is indeed the ossuary of Caiaphas, the high priest. For example, Jonathan Reed and Dominic Crossan in their book, Excavating Jesus, and these guys are no conservatives, but they say there should be no doubt that the chamber was the resting place of the family of the high priest Caiaphas, named in the Gospels for his role in the crucifixion. And it's very likely that the elderly man's bones were those of Caiaphas himself. So that's their take. Now, others are not convinced that Caiaphas is the correct translation, and that's the pivotal word. And others are not convinced that Caiaphas is the correct translation of the inscriptions. Many are. They're convinced. This is Caiaphas' tomb, but somebody says, eh, I'm not sold. Okay, so I let you know that. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. It refers to Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, that he was compelled to carry Jesus' cross. Now, Mark probably mentions Alexander and Rufus because they were known to his audience. So he says, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, so he's letting them know that's the guy I'm talking about. You see, when you see details like that, there's something Mark is doing. So people then knew who these people were. So he identifies them that way. Well, in 1941, Eliezer Sekenik and Naman Avigad, they found a first century ossuary in the Kidron Valley. <clears throat> its lid has the name Alexander inscribed in Greek and Alexander inscribed in Hebrew. But the Hebrew name is followed by a word that probably is an adjective form of Cyrene. In other words, something like Cyrenite. So you've got Alexander in Greek, Alexander in Hebrew, followed by Alexander the Cyrenite. Well, that's interesting. Alexander, son of Simon, also is written in Greek in this green chalky substance on the front, and it's also scratched on the back. Now, the scratching on the back, it looks like there was a false start, and then it was correctly inscribed. But Alexander, uh, Alexander, son of Simon, is scratched there on the back. Now, another ossuary in that same tomb is inscribed, Sarah, daughter of Simon of Ptolemaeus, probably referring to Ptolemaeus in, in Cyrenica. So this is all interesting. Jack Finnegan, who's a well-known scholar, he says in his book, Archaeology of the New Testament, he says, thus we have here a family burial, at least to the extent of two children of a certain Simon, and their place of origin was probably Cyrene. From Acts 6, 9, we know that there was a synagogue of Cyreneans in Jerusalem, and in Mark 15, 21, it was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. It is surely a real possibility that this unostentatious tomb was the last resting place of the bones of at least two members of the family of this very Simon. And so I think that's cool. <laughs> we have these people, you know, these, these people who are identified, and then you dig around and you find these links and these ties to them. Matthew, Mark, and John, <clears throat> they all record that Jesus was crucified at a place known in Aramaic as Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Now Luke simply says that he was crucified at the place called the skull. And John chapter 19 verse 41 says there was a garden at the place where Jesus was crucified and that in the garden was a new tomb. And John 19 42 says the tomb was near where Jesus was crucified. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say the tomb was cut out of rock. And Matthew and Mark specify that the entrance of the tomb was covered with a rolling rock. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 says, and John chapter 19 verse 17, chapter 19 verse 41, they imply that this site was outside the walls. I see people fanning. I'm going to do that. I don't know if that'll help. Outside the walls of the, of the city of Jerusalem at that time. 
So that's all data that you want to factor in in trying to say where is the location of Christ's tomb. Well, there is broad ancient and modern agreement that the tomb of Christ is located at the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is in Jerusalem. Here you see, I'll show you some other pictures, this little uh, tomb shrine that is inside this larger structure. Now notice over here that in the back, the west end, you have first century tombs in here. And I'll show you a picture of those in a second. The so-called garden tomb that was championed by Charles Gordon in the 19th century, that's had its advocates, but archaeological evidence has pretty much shot that down. Now, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, this church is located outside the walls of Jerusalem as they stood at the time of Christ, and it is built over rock tombs that date to the first century. So that's very important to confirm this identification. Now, the Emperor Hadrian, he crushed the Jewish revolt that was led by a man named Bar Kokhba in A.D. 135. Now, when he did that, he crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt, and after he successfully did that in 135, he banned all Jews from Jerusalem. He changed the name of the city from Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina, and he set out to make Jerusalem a thoroughly pagan city. He, they'd had it with the Jews. You know, they've, they've had this after the, the destruction of 70. Here we have another revolt under Bar Kokhba. They... They stomp out that revolt, and then they come in, and they're going to paganize the city. Well, doing that, that included erecting a temple of Jupiter and a shrine to Venus at the site that would later become the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Now, Eusebius, who writes two years after this, 135 is when Hadrian, uh, he finishes off defeating that rebellion, and he builds these... Uh, pagan shrines. Well, 200 years later in the first part of the 4th century, Eusebius implies that Golgotha was then inaccessible, as it would have been if Hadrian had built pagan temples over it. You couldn't get to it. Now, we know from Eusebius, who's a contemporary of the events I'm about to describe, we know from Eusebius that after the Council of Nicaea, that's in AD 325, that the Emperor Constantine, he decided to construct a church at the site of Christ's resurrection. And the fact he ordered the pagan temple torn down and a church erected in its place says that the Christians were confident the tomb was under that temple. So they, hadn't lost, they, they understood where that tomb was. He builds a pagan shrine. Constantine says, we're going to build a church over the site of the resurrection. That thing's got to go, and we're going to build a church on top of it. And Eusebius reports joyfully that the excavations of that time revealed the holy tomb. A.D. 1009, Constantine's church, the one he had built there, was destroyed by the Egyptian Caliph Hakim. And in 1048, a new church was built over the, uh, was built over the tomb. There were further destructions, repairs, and construction. And in 1959, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre it went under a, a major repair program. But here you see the temple shrine called the Edicule. But this temple shrine, which is inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, here is the entrance into that shrine. We just go right in there. And here is a picture of those tombs that I mentioned on the West End, the first century tombs, stone tombs cut out of rock. And so there they are. So we have, like, as I say, there's broad ancient and modern agreement that this is, in fact, the location of the tomb of Jesus. Now, again, you know, is there something that says Jesus was here? No. But you have all of these, these bits of data in this historical recollection and all of this, and you say, that's it. That's where, that's where it is. Now, let me say a bit about the early church. So that's really the life of Christ in his time. A great deal of, of things that connect to that. There are also the things that connect to the early church. In Acts chapter 21, verse 27 to 31, you recall that Paul is accused of bringing a Greek into the temple and defiling the holy place. And that was such a serious offense that the people were seeking to kill him. So bringing a Gentile into 
the holy place into the temple area where Gentiles were not permitted to go was serious business. In 1871, Charles Claremont Gano, he found in Jerusalem a limestone block on which was, it was inscribed in Greek a warning to the Gentiles to stay out of the perimeter surrounding the temple. And it says, let no Gentile, it literally says no other race, enter within the partition and barrier surrounding the temple. Whoever is caught shall be responsible for his subsequent death. And we have that warning right there that you see. And in 1935, a fragment of a second inscription was discovered outside the wall around the Jerusalem's old city. And you could see from that one that the, that the inscribed letters, they were originally painted in red. Just how we would do it. You see, they were, they were painted in red and the partial inscription closely matches the wording and the layout of the full inscription that was discovered by Claremont Gano. So there you have that idea and that warning and that sense of uh, confirmation or corroboration from what you see in Scripture. Now Ananias, he served as the high priest from AD 47 to 59. In Acts chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, he commanded that Paul be struck in the mouth. And in Acts 24, verse 1, he went to Caesarea with Tertullus to make the case against Paul to the governor. Well, in 1989, a partially restored ostracon that was recovered at Masada, Masada's down here, a partially restored ostracon, it was published by Yigael Yadin, Joseph Nave, and Yaakov Meshur. They published this, and that ostracon reads, Ananias the high priest and Akavia his son. So here we have some connection with this biblical person. We have now an extra biblical tie to this person. Now, Romans chapter 16, verse 23, it has a greeting from Erastus, who in the later letter of 2 Timothy is said to have stayed in Corinth. And Paul in Romans 16, 23, he refers to Erastus as the treasurer of the city. So the treasurer of the city of Corinth, Erastus. Now in 1929, a paving stone, it's quite large actually, a paving stone was found near a theater in Corinth and it was published by John Kent in 1966 and it bears the following inscription in Latin. Here it is, these are abbreviations for sua pecunia. And that's the Latin inscription. It continues off over here. It's parts broken. But you have, you see, Erastus right there. But it says, Erastus, who in return for the Edile ship, laid the pavement at his own expense. So this is, this is obviously interesting. Now, an Edile is a commissioner of public works. And that's why the NIV translates treasurer in Romans 16.23 as commissioner of public works. Now it's possible that the word, that the Greek word that's, that's tr typically translated treasure, it's possible that that word is broad enough to encompass this Latin office of edile. So maybe it does have enough flexibility that that would be a legitimate translation of it. Or it's possible that Erastus moved up to that position from treasurer up to edile uh, after Romans was written. But in any event, isn't it interesting that we have Paul referring to Erastus, who's a city official in Corinth, and then we have this. Erastus, who's laying this paving stone and who winds up uh, getting this office of the edile ship. I think that's interesting. Eight, uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 12, reveals that Paul was brought before the tribunal or the judgment seat in Corinth when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. So he's brought there when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. Now, Gallio was the brother of the famous Roman philosopher Seneca. But Paul's brought before him, and in 1905, four fragments of an inscription. Four fragments of an inscription were found and published by the French archaeologist Emile Bourget. 
He found three additional fragments in 1910, which were published in 1913 by a man named Brassic. But these were all ignored, essentially, until 1967, when André Plassart added two additional fragments, and he demonstrated that they all belong to the same inscription, kind of like a puzzle. So when he showed that, he officially published the nine fragments in 1970, and the inscription here, it mentions Gallio. Mentions this person before whom Paul stood, and the inscription is a copy of a letter from the emperor, Roman Emperor Claudius to the city of Delphi, naming Gallio as a friend of Claudius and proconsul of Achaia. And that letter was that, that copy was once attached to the outer wall of a temple. So you have Claudius writes this. This letter then gets copied and placed on the outer wall of a temple. But its real significance, it's very significant in New Testament studies, because its real significance is that when com combined with other information, it permits the year of Gallio's service. He's pro council for a year. It permits that, that year to be dated to either 50 or 51, or more probably 51, 52. And that's, that's very important as a chronological anchor for Paul's activities. You see, when you read something, it says he went here, he sailed here, he did this, he did this. It's hard to, to find out, well, when is this going on? But once you have him standing before somebody in the year 51 to 52, we know now he's in Corinth right then. Ah, well, now I can say, okay, well, when do they travel? Well, they travel at these times a year. Okay, so now I can work back. And it gives me a chronological anchor that allows me to construct the chronology of Paul's life. So it's very important. And that's, of course, been used that way. So that we, we have that. Now, the tribunal or the judgment seat, in Greek it's called a bema. That tribunal or judgment seat before which Paul was brought in Acts chapter 18, verse 12, it refers to a speaker's platform. That's what the judgment seat or the bema was. It's a platform where proclamations were read and citizens appeared before government officials. So it wouldn't really be the kind of place you'd want to go. You know, if you're there before government, at least it's anything like today. But Pilate sat on, Pilate sat on, on uh, the Bema as he judged Christ. You have other officials described as sitting on a Bema, Herod in Acts 12, 21, Festus in Acts 25. And Paul says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. He says that in Romans 14, 10. And he calls it the judgment seat of Christ in, Acts, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Now the Bema at Corinth, was discovered in 1935. And it was identified by Oscar Bronier in 1937. Now, it was described in detail in excavation reports so one can know with confidence that this is the place where Paul stood before Gallio. Right here. He's, Paul is there. That's the platform where Gallio was. There's an inscription that was found in the vicinity of the Bema, that's in Latin, that identifies it as a rostra, which was the Latin name for that structure. And the, based on the style of the letters in the inscription, John Kent, he dates the construction of this Corinthian bema to between 25 and 50. And Paul is there in 51-2, standing before Gallio. And so we're confident this is the spot where that event took place and again I just think it's cool <laughs> all right this is not directly related uh, to scripture but I wanted to mention it anyway as you know Jesus on a number of occasions he's out with the disciples in a boat he's traveling on the Sea of Galilee you see it in Matthew 8 14 and I won't read all the text but he's oftentimes out with them in a boat now, this is where he calmed the storm. This is where he met them walking on the water. Now, in 1986, Moshe and Yuval Lufan, these are just brothers walking along, and they discovered in the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee a wooden boat dating to the first century. Of course, it was painstakingly removed from the mud, 
and restored. But here is what they have. It was 26 feet long, 8 feet wide, large enough to hold 13 people. See, which makes it similar to the boats in which Jesus and the disciples would have traveled. And one notable feature of it is how low it sits in the water. And so I'm thinking about that in terms of these storms. I certainly wouldn't want to be on, uh, on something that's, that's so low. But there you have the reconstruction of that boat. And again, I say that's not directly because you can't say that's a boat that anybody was in or anything like that, but I still thought it was neat. Now, the last item I have, so maybe you'll get to leave early today. Isn't that great? <laughs> the last item I have is that one of Jesus' brothers. He was, of course, named James. And he became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was the author of the letter of James. And Josephus reports that he was stoned to death in A.D. 62 as a, quote, breaker of the law, which was a charge that was no doubt tied to his uh, Christian faith in some way, shape, or form. Now, in 2002, Biblical Archaeology Review published an ossuary with an inscription in Aramaic. You can see the inscription carved here. But published it with an inscription in Aramaic. Here is a close-up of the inscription. It's a little bit blurry. But it reads... James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Now, before he published that find, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, uh, Herschel Shanks, he's a Jew. Before he published it, he had the inscription authenticated by two of the world's leading epigraphers, and he had the ossuary itself authenticated by the Geological Survey of Israel. But despite that, the Israel Antiquities Authority, which had been left out of the loop in this. So he has these people, these experts examine it. He has this geological survey of Israel examine it. And when he had that, he published it. But he didn't go through them. And so they were left out of the loop regarding that fine. They prosecuted the ossuary's owner, a man named uh, Oded Golan. They prosecuted him for forgery saying that he had, he had fabricated this thing. The trial went on for over seven years. This is yeah, over seven years, and Golan was finally declared not guilty on March 14th of 2012. But, of course, the response is that doesn't mean he didn't forge it. It just means the government did, wasn't able to prove. That, okay, but he was declared not guilty, and there were a number of things that were said by the judge to the prosecutors in that case. Well, Herschel Shanks again, who's the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, he's laid out the evidence that in his view leaves, he says, quote, no doubt, end quote, the inscription is authentic. And he has blistered the Israeli Antiquities Authority for its unsubstantiated claims and its groundless political persecution of Golan. And indeed, it's significant when, when one of Israel's leading paleographers, Ada Yardeni, declares... If this is a forgery, I quit. <laughs> now, that's what she said. And another leading paleo paleography, Andre Lemaire, who's from the Sorbonne, uh, he's equally confident of the inscription's antiquity and its authenticity. So you can do with it what you want. You can say, well, there are a lot of people. Maybe this combination isn't that rare, and people have said that. Uh, but I find it quite interesting, but I think Shanks is correct he recognizes that whatever this is, the controversy over its authenticity, however groundless, that it will, it will always cause this to be tainted, and you'll never be able to really get much mileage out of it because it'll all, well, that's contested. You see, that's up in the air. Who knows? Forgery. They tried him, just didn't prove it. So he recognizes that. that this, and there, there are a number of other things like that that I, that, you know, um, you have these archaeological finds where they say, well, no, we don't believe this, but actually proving those things. You see, so, I mean, how do you go about proving it? You bring in people, this is their world, this is what they do. You bring in experts, and they say, no, this is an authentic inscription. And they look at it, and they look at it under microscopes, and they do all this stuff. And as Shanks has said, they never come up with anybody who's an expert 
you know, a paleographer, a pigrapher, anybody who does, who does this, who has said it's not authentic. And so he thinks, listen, there's something going on here. So I, I give that to you as the last one. Just you can do with it what you will, but it is interesting, and the controversy over it, I'm sure, will always go on. But I did see this morning, by the way, on the Drudge Report that some guy's claiming he's found Jesus' tomb. So I'm thinking, yeah, okay. Yeah, with his wife and all that kind of stuff. You know how that stuff goes. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And son. That's right. So these kinds of things come out. And typically, they're trying to sell books, I think. I realize I never turned my light on. But I hope I'm looking good anyway. But, all right, two weeks. Yeah, he's, he's got a picture. We have two weeks. Uh, I have something else in mind. I'm not telling you now because I'm not certain I'm going to do that. Uh, but I have a two-week class I'll put in whether I'll do one thing and then another thing or, or a two-week class. Right now I'm thinking of one two-week class. October 9th, back in the auditorium, I'm going to do the historical case for the resurrection of Christ, guessing that's six weeks. Then I think I'm going to do 1 Corinthians. Uh, so I just carry on. All right, that's it. Look, you got free time. Thank you. <laughs>